are super excited to be continuing our Decoded conference for today. Um, this is an all-day conference for those of you guys who, who haven't joined who haven't joined us for the first session. This is the first session you're joining us. I'm super excited to have you. If you want to mind going to the next slide, Carter. Perfect. So today we are talking about short shipping deductions. So we're going to be covering multiple different retailers and what that process looks like for each of the retailers. So we both have two um, just experts in this area. If you wouldn't mind going to the next slide. Um, so we have both Carter King and Eric Smith. They both lead the product development here at Supply Pike for a couple of our products. Eric is the director of products, so he owns the whole shebang. And then Carter actually owns our DE, which is our Document Explorer application, which helps streamline a lot of the short shipping deductions um, that you might be experiencing from multiple different retailers. So they are experts in this field. They've been working in it for such a long time. So super excited to have them here today in order to cover that with y'all. All right, if you wouldn't mind going to the next one. All right, so today we're going to be going over what shortages are, and just in general, how you can avoid them, how you can dispute them. Then we're going to be doing a deep dive into the different shortages, what shortages look like for retailer specific. So a lot of the big ones, we're looking at Walmart, we're looking at Target, we're looking at Amazon. Um, and then we're going to reserve the last 15 minutes in order for us to answer some questions. Now we will be taking questions throughout. So um, please, if you have a question, we're on a slide and you see it um, and you're like, oh, I want to know know what this means, um, please um, send it in. And we can, if it has to do with the slide that we're covering, we'll go ahead and cover that. All right. So some quick, um, just FAQs, um, you will get a copy of the slide deck. So we'll give you a copy of both the slide deck and the recording of today's entire conference. So you will get all of the information sent to your inbox. You will definitely receive that. So be prepared, look for that in about three to four business days. Um, what is the best way to ask a question? So down at the bottom, you're gonna see a little Q&A chat bubble. You're going to pick the one that has the two bubbles instead of the one that says chat. Um, you're going to pick the one that says Q&A. Um, inside of that, that's going to be the easiest way for us to see your questions and make sure that we answer them. And sometimes our chat really blows up and um, we, we, we're we not able to get everything in there. So um, if you wouldn't mind sending your questions through the Q&A, that'll be the easiest way for us to kind of manage those. Perfect. All right. Um, for those of you who don't know who Supply Pike is, we are a software company. We're actually based in Fayetteville, Arkansas. So it's a beautiful day here in Fayetteville for those of you who are not located in Northwest Arkansas. Um, but we are based in Fayetteville, Arkansas, and we build software for retail suppliers. So um, we are fairly close to Walmart home office. That's where our, our um Product development actually started focusing on Walmart suppliers, but we've expanded this past year into Kroger, into Target, into Amazon, and we built these tools in order to help them resolve their revenue loss issues. So anything that is impacting your bottom line, we are going to build tools in order to help you solve that. We have over 400 CPGs that we've helped um, recover over $25 billion in retail um, and money, and uh, we've helped over uh, 50 product categories. So these are just some of the companies that we work with. Um, we would love to be able to add, add you guys to this list, list if you're interested in a demo. All right. Now that's enough about us. Let's dive into the content. If you have any questions, again, please um, throw them in the Q&A chat and we'll make sure that we answer them. Hand it off to you guys. All right. Thanks, Melody. And good morning, everybody. Um, so we'll jump right into it and start at the very top. What is a shortage? Um, a shortage deduction, also commonly known as a short ship deduction, uh, is pretty aptly named in my opinion. Uh, it occurs anytime the retailer withholds payment from an invoice uh, claiming that they did not receive some or all of the goods that were invoiced. Um, so yeah, pretty straightforward as to what it is. Um, didn't receive what you are trying to invoice for. Here in uh, being in Northwest Arkansas, we generally default to giving examples around Walmart. So just a quick example here. Uh, code 24 is a really common shortage deduction that we see with Walmart. Um, in this quick example, a supplier received a purchase order from Walmart for three cases of orange juice three cases of grapefruit and three cases of pomegranate juice. Um, 
they shipped and then invoiced for those nine total cases and then received a code 24 deduction on that invoice um, with Walmart claiming that they only received the three cases of orange juice and are withholding payment for those other six cases. So what may lead to that happening? Um, this is certainly not an exhaustive list. It uh, can happen for a lot of different reasons and can happen kind of for um, maybe multiple reasons. Um, so some of the really common ones, poor labeling um, and receiving errors, those kind of go hand in hand. Uh, receiving errors are you know, many times caused by poor labeling, uh, but they may also just be due to kind of human error and people moving really fast in the warehouse uh, when they're actually doing that receiving. Um, another pretty common one is mismatched pack types. Uh, so this is shipping items uh, differently and when, it, when it comes to packaging. Um, so if you've got some items that are cases of three, others that are cases of six, or some where you're shipping an entire PO on one pallet uh, versus, you know, kind of in, in that same order, maybe you've gotten multiple POs on a, on a pallet. So um, mismatched pack types or kind of just non-uniform packaging, a uh, pretty common one. And uh, another one is invoice being sent before the shipment arrived or was fully received. Uh, I've seen this one kind of uh, start to happen more frequently in the last few years as uh, DCs are, are kind of a bottleneck and, and things aren't being received particularly timely. Um, they, yeah, they, getting the invoice before the items are actually received is almost always going to going to cause a shortage deduction. So again, going back to a Walmart example here, um, this short shipping can, can really compound not just with deductions, but can have um, more costly, uh, lead to more costly fines down the line as well. So with Walmart in this example here, we got hit with a code 24 deduction for not shipping those uh, cases of pomegranate and grapefruit juice. That also could lead to a uh, PO defect fine as part of Walmart's SWEP program. And then will also um, hurt your OTIF score, particularly the in full part. So uh, depending on what that score is at the end of the month uh, may lead to another fine. So uh, as you can see, you can get hit from multiple angles um, as far as losing money to short shipping. We'll touch on these uh, a little bit, uh, a little bit more further on in the in the presentation. Uh, but just you know, kind of quickly, what we see is the most common shortage deductions at the different retailers: uh, Code 22 at Walmart, Code AO30 uh, with Target, a shortage chargeback at Amazon, and a Code 6 at Kroger. So um, these are again not exhaustive list of the different shortages. These are just the most common at these retailers. And what we've seen is it pretty well across the board at all major retailers, shortages are the most common type of deduction. So uh, speaking of it not being an exhaustive list, Walmart actually has 11 different codes that fall under the uh, shortage umbrella. Um, you, know, you can kind of quickly see the breakdown of the different ones. Code 22 being kind of far and away the, the biggest one on average that we're seeing across all suppliers. Uh, 24s and 25s also extremely common. So yeah, kind of quick info here. If you have any more questions or need some info on specific codes, I'd invite you guys to go over to um, the supplier wiki site on supplypike.com to get a uh, you know, full description of each code and, and what it is and details on avoiding it and, and basic information like that. Hey, Carter, so we do have a question. All right, you ready? So can you define what overage defect type means? So an overage defect, um, I well, I may kick that one over to Eric as he is a little more uh, well versed in the Walmart world of deductions. Yeah, happy to happy to answer that one. So, um, I'm assuming your question is related to the shortage defect that Carter mentioned on a couple slides previous. Um, 
with retailers like Walmart, uh, they have compliance programs that will ding you for a variety of reasons, um, one of which would be a shortage defect like Carter mentioned. Um, essentially what the, the retailer is trying to do is to get suppliers to conform to exactly how orders are transmitted. So if they order 10 cases, they want 10 cases shipped. Uh, not nine, not 11, they want 10 cases. Um, so Walmart, for example, will fine you if you're over or under the number of ordered cases, um, even regardless of what you invoice. So if your invoice matches what you ship, that's great. You shouldn't receive a deduction for that, but you could still receive a compliance fine if you ship more or less than what was ordered. Um, so that would be an overage defect. Uh, it's exactly what it sounds like. The retailer says you shipped more than they ordered. Um, for retailers like Walmart, that's particularly painful because they'll hit you with a fine for not shipping according to the purchase order. And Walmart won't pay you for overage or for over shipped product uh, willingly. <laughs> if you want paid on that additional case that you shipped, you would have to invoice Walmart for that overage. And a lot of suppliers either don't have that or don't have the time because it can be a really tedious process to keep up with that. And so you're, you're, you know, if it truly was an overage, you're paying the price for that in terms of, you know, not receiving payment for those over cases, as well as the fines for not shipping according to the PO. Hopefully that answers your question. If you have any follow-ups to that, I'd definitely jump back into the Q and A. We have to go deeper. Great, thanks, Eric. So uh, we're going to move along, kind of covered the basics of what a shortage is. Uh, I'm going to touch high level on some ways that you can uh, work to avoid shortages. So uh, obviously there are going to be some nuances with each retailer, but I'm going to cover some kind of best practices here that you can do um, across the board to, to try and avoid shortage deductions. Um, submitting only one invoice per PO when possible. So just trying to make sure that kind of everything is aligned and all of the documents are, are essentially one-to-one. -one. So one invoice for one PO. Um, if you're seeing like consistently getting these shortage or, or receiving type deductions, um, I'd encourage you to confirm your item setups are configured correctly with that retailer. Um, and that's going to be done, you know, it's going to be a little bit different for each retailer, but generally going to be within that retailer portal, uh, just going in, making sure your item packs are set up correctly. Um, so, you know, with, with Walmart uh, vendor packs and warehouse pack quantities, really important to make sure those are set up correctly. So when they're actually receiving them, um, it, you know, correlates with what's actually within that pack. Uh, another really important one that, that can help out the receiving team within the, the retailer DCs is um, putting the item numbers on the invoice itself. Again, just trying to keep that one-to-one -one with the purchase order. So um, you know, what's on the invoice uh, correlates directly with what is on the purchase order. And then kind of harping on the same thing here, um, making sure your invoice matches the PO. Um, and that you don't make adjustments on the invoice that don't match the PO. With that said, that is kind of ideal. If, if you are going to short ship, you know, ideally you can get in front of it and make adjustments to the purchase order itself. And then once you do actually invoice, you invoice based on what is on the purchase order. If that's not possible and you realize that a you know, short ship happened after the PO has already um, left, still best practice to invoice what was actually shipped. Um, you know, that's kind of the key way to, to avoiding a, a shortage deduction is don't invoice for more than what was actually shipped. Uh, but again, in an ideal world, if you're going to short ship, catch it up front and make that adjustment on the purchase order itself. All right. So I do have another question. I actually have two questions if you're ready. Okay. Is all of this applicable as well to Walmart Canada or is this you? Walmart USA specific? So yeah, this is going to be um, kind of high level best practices that are going to be applicable across the board for, for most, most any retailer. Perfect. And awesome. one thing I would add on to that, um, we were talking uh, overage defect fines and that sort of thing earlier. Um, as Carter said, all of these best practices 
pretty much everything related to shortage deductions in general is going to apply to Walmart US and Walmart Canada. Uh, one thing I'll note, uh, the overage defect fines, like PO defect fines, are part of Walmart's SQEP or SQEP program, which at the moment is rolled out to Walmart US, uh, not, should not be impacting Canadian suppliers, uh, to the best of my knowledge. Um, the one you know, compliance program uh, to, to keep an eye on there uh, is you know, SQEP for, for Walmart US. So yeah, sorry, Walmart US. Yeah, good call out. We have a, another question. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't know if you're ready or if I should save it. Okay. Um, we shipped exactly what the purchase order requested. The bill of lading states that, and we still got hit with an overage deduction. What do we do now? Yeah. Um, a little bit of detail on which retailer this applies to would be great. Um, given the context that we've been talking about, might be asking about Walmart here. Um, so what you described is really common, unfortunately. I know Carter is going to talk about this here in a minute, but key thing to remember with deductions and compliance fines, really all of this type of revenue loss we're discussing, uh, it just because it happened doesn't mean it actually happened, if that makes sense. It, just because you got the fine or the deduction doesn't mean that the issue actually occurred. There are invalid deductions that happen all the time, including for overages, you know, product being misreceived in that manner. So it depends on the retailer uh, to answer your question here, if you're getting an overage, uh, you know, fine or you know, something like that. Um, for Walmart, uh, you've got a couple of options. Um, if you believe you truly did not ship over, you could fight that overage fine by providing the proof documentation that you mentioned. Uh, the purchase order, uh, copy of the invoice, a copy of your bill of lading or proof of delivery um, to try to get that fine waived. Another option, if you're a Walmart supplier, is to say, hey, yeah, we got a $50 fine for not complying with the PO by shipping too much, uh, but it might actually get us more money back if we just said, okay, whatever, maybe Walmart says we ship too much, even though we don't think we did, let's just invoice for that extra product that Walmart says that they received. Uh, you know, it's a good chance that that's more than $50 worth of product. So what a lot of suppliers will do is say, forget the, the SQUEP fine uh, for a low dollar amount, let's just invoice and get paid on that overage um, and, and try to go that route. If they don't pay you for the overage, then obviously turn around and fight the compliance fine to say, okay, well, if you're not gonna pay us for the overage, then obviously it wasn't over, so we shouldn't get the fine. Um, hope that makes sense uh, and answers your question. That was a good question. All right, so some more kind of operational things you can do. Um, in probably in your warehouse around packaging and labeling to try and avoid these shortage deductions in the first place. Uh, we would advise you to avoid master packs if at all possible. Master packs make it really difficult for anyone to verify what is actually in, uh, in the shipment um, and makes, uh, makes the proof proving uh, an invalid deduction uh, really difficult. We'd also recommend using slip sheets between POs if you're shipping on pallets, and, and obviously if you're shipping multiple POs on a single pallet. If there's a way to kind of, you know, put a slip sheet in between uh, the, the cases for the different POs, some way to designate that, um, you know, there are multiple orders on that single pallet. Um, clearly identifying PO number and facility number on the labels is always key. Um, and then making sure those labels are easily visible and accessible. Um, so they're not kind of, you know, all of them are facing the outside of a um, palette, if, if that's uh, the case. Uh, color coding can also be really helpful for the people that are receiving the, the product uh, in the retailer DCs. So both uh, to differentiate between different products on the same order or um, different orders uh, within the same shipment. So just trying to make it really obvious as to what the what is being received at the DC. Yeah, Carter, one thing I would add there, uh, you're exactly right. I can't count the number of suppliers we've worked with who've made a change like this. Um, you know, different colored packing tape or stickers on boxes, like really simple change like that to uh, differentiate between 
you know, cases. So this is a case of orange juice. This is a case of apple juice. Um, most suppliers, typically, those boxes are going to look identical uh, from the outside. Obviously, the person receiving them at the DC is you know, moving fast. Usually, they're not you know, taking a super close look. So if they're looking at a pallet stacked three by three by three, they're thinking, you know, this looks like all the same product. I'm going to scan one and punch in the total number and move on. Um, so you, you can never completely get rid of invalid short shipping deductions. Like we've never met a supplier who's completely erased them because there's so much human error that occurs, but you can really help limit the, the flow of these by taking some simple steps to make it easier for your product to be received. Um, and color coding or stickers or packing tape differentiation has been one of the simplest ways that we've seen to make a really big downstream impact and help reduce the flow of some of these. All right, so uh, moving along the presentation here. Um, next, we're gonna touch on disputing shortages. Uh, so as Eric mentioned, um, you're, you're gonna face some shortages if you're uh, doing business with a retailer. So um, be prepared to dispute them and we'll talk through that now. Um, so the things you can do to prepare to fight invalid shortages, um, have packing lists that match the ASN and invoice. So again, just having documentation of exactly what was supposed to be on an order, what was picked, uh, what was packed, and uh, making sure those all align between the different types of documents. So in this case, uh, ASN, invoice, and then uh, the packing list that, that generally um, gets, uh, gets printed off to help uh, the order get put together. If you're shipping collect, um, make it a habit to uh, require the driver to sign the BOL. Um, I know, again, people can be in a rush, but this is really key. We really need to make sure that you get that signature on the BOL because that you know, is, what, is what really constitutes the proof. Um, and uh, on the flip side of that, make sure that you're storing those documents and ideally you're storing them digitally. So. Um, if any of you out there have implemented electronic BOLs, eBOLs, um, hats off to you. I think that is the way of the future. Um, digitizing these or having digital records in the first place is always better. But at a minimum, you need to be scanning these documents and uh, storing them in a digital fashion so that once you do inevitably get this shortage, you've got all of your proof documentation uh, readily available and you can hopefully find it pretty quickly. If you're prepaid, um, always better to get in front of gathering your proof of delivery documents. Um, I think you, we've not uncommon, depending on your payment terms with the retailer, that you can get hit with a shortage deductions 90 plus days after the shipment actually receives, is, is um, sorry, received. Um, so that can be a problem. Uh, again, not uncommon for carriers, which is generally the source of those POD documents, um, that they can archive those PODs after some amount of time. So um, if you don't have those up front, and by the time you need them, they have already been uh, archived, you have to just jump through more hoops uh, to be able to get those documents that you need. And just obviously more hoops equals uh, more time, more effort to actually dispute, um, dispute those deductions. Something else you can do to get ahead of this, um, make sure your shipping documents are in order. Um, for the most part, at least with BOLs, we see that you know there's pretty standard format, um, but you need to make sure that you're you're you know following that standard format. So uh, make sure that they have the PO number on them and uh, kind of in a, a very visible place. Uh, the ship to address is on there and correct. So this is gonna be where that shipment is actually going to, the retailer DC uh, most commonly. The item and item quantity info is key. Um, so you, know, you need to be able to prove that 100 cases were shipped. That 100 cases needs to be uh, designated on the actual shipping documents themselves. And then also the signature is key, right? So that's what, 
says that someone has actually verified this document to be correct and is, mat is matched up with what is actually on the shipment. Um, one other thing to point out here, uh, SLC, shipper load count. Um, this basically is a checkbox on a BOL uh, that designates that the driver did not count or verify what was on the shipment, only the shipper did. So in this case, the supplier. And uh, if you're shipping collect and it's SLC, it makes it really difficult to prove that a shortage was invalid um, because nobody has verified that, you know, it, that what's on the shipment is actually matches up to what is on the shipping document. Um, Prepaid SLC, uh, you have a little more leeway. It's still, you know, kind of probably going to lead to potentially more uh, deductions. You do have a little bit more to go on there and isn't, you know, you still have the ability to kind of uh, win that deduction with, with, the, with the POD. Um, but if possible, I know there can be some potential pros to SLC. Maybe you can get things out the door faster. Um, but if you want to prepare to, to fight these invalid shortages, SLC is really kind of a detriment to that effort. And Carter, I'll jump in there because I saw a question in the Q&A that, that goes along with that topic. Um, so saw that we had a, a question saying, you know, we tried to dispute a deduction with Walmart. Walmart came back and said, well, the, the details on the shipment were, you know, uh, verified by the, the shipper or the supplier. So that's exactly what Carter's been talking about here. Um, for collect, like you said, that's that's really, really difficult uh, to fight those because what would be your proof documentation is, you know, basically you know, the only party verifying that is, is you, the supplier, uh, who's trying to get it paid back. Unfortunately, we do see that as uh, one of the more common reasons that shortage deduction disputes get denied. Um, is when those documents are marked you know, shipper loading count or said to contain uh, makes it makes it difficult. Um, we've seen some suppliers have a little bit of success with some of the other items like Carter mentioned, such as a packing list, an advanced ship notice. Um, I'll say your mileage may vary on that because that is not uh, something that Walmart uh, or most retailers will typically accept as proof documentation. Um, but it is just you know, more documentation to help your cause, um, and you, know, you can try to push back there. But uh, shipper load and count for collect suppliers is going to be an uphill battle for sure. Um, as Carter said, for prepaid suppliers, if you are shipper load and count and the retailer refuses to pay back a, de a shortage deduction, then uh, sometimes you can uh, take that up with the carrier themselves. All right, so uh, staying on the theme of shipping documents, um, that is going to be your primary proof to um, to dispute a, a shortage deduction. Um, so primary shipping documents, again, is going to, uh, or what you would need to, to dispute is going to vary depending on how you actually ship. So collect, it's going to be the signed bill of lading uh, for prepaid customers, it's going to be the proof of delivery. So bill of lading uh, proves that it was picked up from the supplier. Proof of delivery proves that it was delivered to the retailer. Uh, I mentioned a few minutes ago, BOLs are fairly standard. Uh, this is a pretty common format. Um, kind of key things to note and make sure that you're putting on the document and then it's very clear. Um, the destination, which DC or store that a purchase order is going to, the purchase order number itself, item information, and in particular, uh, the quantities of the different items that are on that shipment, and the carrier signature, which proves that um, a you know, another party verified this information to be accurate. So um, again, for collect suppliers, this is the you know, legally binding document that proves uh, transfer of ownership happened when it was picked up. Proof of delivery documents can vary a bit more. Um, 
and primarily um, as to whether the shipment was live unloaded as soon as it, was, as it arrived to a DC or store, or if it was a drop trailer situation and unloaded uh, later. So uh, in the first scenario where it is a live unload, we will generally expect to see um, an OSND stamp or section on the bill of lading um, that gets filled out when the shipment is delivered and unloaded at the retailer. Um, what we're looking at in particular is going to be the O, S, and D section towards the right of this stamp. So what we're, you know, best case scenario and what would prove an invalid shortage is if we have this uh, checkbox for freight bill received in full. Um, if that's not there um, and a shortage is noted, it, you know, kind of proves that the, the uh, shipment was not, was received short, and that will designate the number of uh, cases that were short. For the drop trailer scenario, what we would expect to see as proof of delivery is a drop trailer or gate stamp. So this proves that the order was delivered or the shipment was delivered to the retailer on a date and time. Um, what it does not prove is if it was received in full or short um, because it, it was not unloaded at the time of delivery. So um, this is valid proof and what you know would be required to dispute a shortage deduction. And this kind of shifts the burden of proof to the retailer if the dispute gets denied. So they would then have to come back and say, yes, it was received when we actually unloaded it and received the individual items. This is what you know was received short. So that I would expect to see them provide that OS and D document um, if they deny the dispute. All right. So, um, Melody, do we have some questions? We do have some questions. Um, it is about SLC. So I figured before we started the next section, we could try to answer a couple of those. Um, so for collect, how can you avoid SLC? Truckers are unwilling to verify. What are the options? Yeah, I can jump in there with, you know, something I've seen at least, Carter, you, you may have some more detail on this. Um, for collect, it's tough because you don't own that relationship. You don't own the, the rates with a particular carrier. You're kind of dependent on whoever shows up. Um, one thing I'll say uh, seems to be a symptom of uh, really tight turnarounds. So if you know a trucker shows up to pick up a load, things are running behind at your warehouse, you know, they kind of got to throw it on the truck and head out. Um, drivers are going to be much less willing to verify quantities um, because of that tight timeline. Um, so what we typically advise suppliers to do for pickups is, you know, if possible, book a wider pickup window and have goods ready to go, uh, you know, at the beginning of that pickup window. So you're giving yourselves and the driver the most possible time uh, to receive that pickup. Um, you know, other things that I've seen be effective, uh, maybe not effective, but if there's no way around uh, going shipper load and count for a collect pickup. A lot of suppliers are taking you know, photographic evidence. You know, they're, uh, uh, I've had suppliers video themselves loading product onto the truck. Uh, again, that falls into the category of types of proof that a lot of retailers don't necessarily uh, put a whole lot of stock in, uh, but it does kind of build your case to a degree. Um, so we, we've definitely seen suppliers equip their, their warehouse folks with the uh, technology they need to be you know, taking uh, photographic evidence uh, as well as getting signed bills of lading. Uh, yeah, Carter, anything you'd add there? Yeah, no, I, I think I would just echo that. Um, kind of the best, best thing you can do is just to try and have the order staged and ready and then laid out in a way that, you know, doesn't require a lot of effort from the driver. So you're not making them kind of walk around to different sections of your warehouse. If you have it all there kind of ready to be uh, loaded onto that truck and easily counted and verified, um, kind of the best thing you can do in, in my opinion. I do have one other question on shipper load and count. And I think 
And we also had a comment. Um, so I'll say the comment first. Um, so for some trucking companies, drivers are not allowed to count or go into the warehouse to count loads. Do you guys, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I, that, that is true. Um, you know, for me, a lot of these, there's pros and cons to you know any decision that you make and collect versus prepaid is, is certainly a decision to be made for each individual business. Um, I will say just anecdotally from my experience, this type of issue is one of the main reasons that a lot of suppliers will move from collect to prepaid. Now there are you know plenty of scenarios where it makes more sense to be collect uh, for you know for your business or for you know a specific customer, but um, moving to a prepaid uh, you know, freight program can give you a lot more control uh, over uh, the movement of goods, and you know that can often offset maybe an incremental cost if you don't have the purchasing power to negotiate strong rates. Um, the cost can often be offset by, you know, the ability to prove what was actually shipped if you're dealing with a lot of invalid shortages. I think that's great. You guys are, these are great answers to these questions. So I love it. Um, okay. So I think we might've covered this a little bit, but if you wouldn't mind reiterating, um, so with the shipper load or with SLC freight collect shortages, how effective is it to require the retailer to prove the seal placed at the manufacturer is intact at delivery. Either of you guys want to take that one? <laughs> yeah, I, I honestly, I don't know the answer to that one. Um, you know, I've not, I'm not sure I've seen a supplier try to push back. We, we certainly see those types of denials from retailers where, we'll, where they'll say, you know, seal was intact. I've never actually seen a retailer prove that. Uh, Carter, have you? No, I'm I'm not familiar with that either. Yeah, so that you know, curious if you've tried that, what your success has been, drop it in the chat. Yeah, um, yeah that so you know, one thing I'll say, and we'll get into this here in, in just a second a little bit as we get into retailer specific stuff, but um we see denials to shortage disputes from retailers oftentimes for just wild, wacky, off the wall reasons. And sometimes all it takes is pushing back a couple of times. Some retailers, retailers will let you do that and some won't. Um, but yeah, we've seen suppliers push back and challenge some of the denial reasons and eventually wind up being successful. Um, like I said, I, I'm not sure I've seen anybody push a retailer to prove that a seal was still intact, uh, but I'd be really curious to, to see how that works for you. Awesome. That's very helpful. Thank you. So I know that we still have a lot of content to cover, so I will push us forward and then we'll get to some of these other questions um, towards the end. All righty. I think, uh, think it's me now. So uh, Carter, thank you so much. Awesome job covering uh, you know, shortage deductions at a high level. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of general stuff related to short shipping deductions that applies to any retailer that you might deal with. Um, for the balance of our time here, uh, we want to dive deep into some of the largest retailers and some of the nuance with their programs and how they deal with shortage deductions. At Supply Pike, we believe really strongly that, yes, there's a ton of value and a base knowledge of these types of issues for all of your customers, but to be most effective at fixing issues and getting paid back for invalid issues, be most effective, you really need an understanding of the retailers themselves because there's nuance at every retailer. Um, so we've only got you know 15 minutes or so, so we can't get too deep today, but did want to give a little bit of detail on a few different retailers. So um, looking at Walmart, Target, Amazon, Kroger, you know, some of the top seven or so retailers in terms of volume, um, what are, what are the pain points related to disputing and shortage deductions in general, uh, and, and how do they vary? So for Walmart, uh, what we see is the data for a lot of this information is spread out, and Walmart has a lot of nuance to their process, um, more so than any other retailer that we deal with. Walmart's pro disputing process is nuanced, and to be effective, you got to know when to push back, what information to provide. Um, and what I was just talking about, some of these rejection reasons on your disputes that just kind of make no sense, or you're like, how could they possibly prove that? Um, understanding that 
those types of scenarios and knowing when to push back. Um, that's what separates suppliers who get a little bit back from suppliers who get everything they possibly can pay back for those invalid deductions. Um, with Target, uh, what we often see being the largest pain point there is, uh, again, data is spread out across multiple apps um, and querying the data within their systems, you know, be it Partners Online or Greenfield, getting the data you need can be a little bit tricky at times, uh, which can really slow down the disputing process. Uh, Amazon is a unique beast. Amazon uh, has, a, I guess, they've branded something. They have a program that they call Smart Match, where they will uh, sometimes take a deduction. And then over the next 30 days or so, there's a chance that they might find some of those cases were considered short and pay back parts of the deduction. So a challenge with Amazon is understanding you know, what is actually still outstanding for me to try to fight versus maybe they paid back a couple of the short cases, but not all of them. And the other trick with Amazon is you only have one shot to dispute them. If you submit a dispute and it's denied, you can't dispute it again through their normal dispute process. Uh, you have to escalate it with a ticket. And so uh, there's kind of more of a sense of, you know, you got one shot, you better make it count with Amazon, although we definitely see success with escalations as well. Uh, lastly, with Kroger, the kicker with Kroger is just a really short time frame. So Kroger only allows disputes for 180 days from the time the deduction is taken. Contrast that with someone like Walmart, where typically in most scenarios, you have two years uh, from the time a deduction is taken. So Kroger, you're on a time crunch and most teams, most supplier teams, are operating way behind when deductions are actually taken just because they're so tedious to deal with. You know, it might be three, six months before they get around to being able to research and dispute. Um, so Kroger, there's not a lot of data available in their system, uh, which makes them slow to research. And that's, you know, the, you feel the pain of that, especially so with Kroger because of that short dispute window. Um, talked a little bit about this, but you know, just looking at their platforms where deductions can be viewed and disputed, there's some differences as well. Um, for example, with Walmart, they have different portals for their accounts payable deductions like shortages versus their accounts receivable deductions like compliance fines. So you've got different portals for different things. Um, but with all of these, you can submit disputes in the app where you can view your shortage deductions. Um, things like Synergy, they don't have detailed invoice information available in the same portal where, where you're viewing your deductions information. So there's, again, this, this process of having to jump around between their, their portals, their tools, and your internal systems uh, to find the info that you need. Uh, lastly, the process for how disputes are submitted and managed once they get to the retailer looks different. Uh, by retailer. And this is where I'd say, you know, there's usually the biggest knowledge gap with supplier teams of how to operate within these retailers. So for retailers like uh, Walmart and Target, uh, you know, oftentimes you can lean a little bit on your merchant, on your buyer for assistance if you're not getting anywhere with the dispute team. But for Amazon and Kroger, you really get not, you hardly get any assistance from your buyer uh, if you need to push back. You are kind of dealing with yelling at your screen without a whole lot of support there. Uh, with Amazon, like I talked about, you can only submit once. Walmart and Kroger actually use a third party to manage disputes. So you're not even dealing with Walmart when you submit a dispute to Walmart. You're dealing with a third party on behalf of Walmart, which can really, you know, makes it a game of telephone and you can, can slow things down. Kroger's the same way. So, yeah, let's jump into just uh, some of the examples of the most common types of shortage deductions at each retailer. I know we're tight on time, so I'll move fast through these. But with Walmart, far and away, the most common code or reason code that we see is the code 22, which is a generic you invoiced for more than you shipped us, uh, like Carter explained at the beginning of the call. Um, if you can go to the next slide, uh, for these code 22s, um, in these scenarios, your bill of lading or your proof of delivery could show that the product was received in full. Maybe the bill of lading was for 10 cases and 10 cases showed up at the, the DEC, but they're claiming that you invoiced for 15, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Contrast that with the next slide, a code 24 at Walmart. Uh, these are shortage deductions where the freight bill itself was signed short. Um, so again, the facility receives less than they expected to receive. 
So some nuance there in practice, these function about the same, you fight them the same way for Walmart. Um, but we see code 22s making up about 60% of all shipping related deductions for Walmart uh, and code 24s are just not quite as common. If you wanna jump to the next slide, Melody, I saw you pop up, do you have a question there? I do have a question, but I realize that we're going to come up to Kroger in a second, so I will wait until we get there. Okay, I'm trying to finish in time to go into all the questions that I'm seeing uh, flying around in the Q&A as well. So uh, if we jump to code 25s, I think on the next slide, the last one I'll talk about for Walmart is a code 25. These are super common as well. They're also very commonly invalid. And just like the 22s and 24s, code 25s are a scenario where Walmart says, we received an invoice from you but we never got any product at all. Not that it was like short a few cases, nothing showed up, no shipment showed up at all. Um, Walmart will pay that invoice and then deduct it in full. And essentially they're closing that invoice out and saying this one's done, but we never got anything. Other retailers like Target, those invoices where they don't think they received anything just kind of float out into the ether. Walmart never like pays and deducts them. They just go unpaid altogether. So. On the one hand, it's kind of nice where Walmart at least gives you some indication that they're not gonna pay it because they pay it and deduct in full. Um, but code 25s can be very costly because it's the full amount of an invoice getting deducted. Um, to dispute this, you obviously just need to prove that you did in fact ship this and then made it to their DC or their store, wherever you're shipping it to. Uh, but on the next slide, uh, the, the thing that we most often see with code 25s is that they're typically a timing issue. Carter mentioned this a little bit, but knowing uh, that uh, you know goods are received at a certain time, if there's no invoice to receive those goods against, um, that can be a trigger for these code 25s within Walmart system to trigger automatically. Uh, so what we've seen be very effective, and we know Walmart recommends this as well, uh, at preventing invalid code 25s is to just adjust when you are transmitting your invoice to Walmart rather than transmitting the invoice when goods leave your dock transmit the invoice for say the must arrive by date or the expected arrival date for when it should arrive at the retailer to ensure that they're not receiving good uh, where you or they're not getting an invoice where they have not received goods yet um, like i said we see this eliminate a huge chunk not always all but a huge chunk of invalid code 25s um, some suppliers say, well, we don't want to transmit our invoices later because we want paid as soon as possible. Um, but Walmart and most other retailers base your payment terms on when goods are received, not when you transmit the invoice. So backing the invoice up and sending it a few days later when goods arrive at the DEC is not going to slow down your payment at all. Uh, that payment, you know, if you're net 30 or net 60, that clock starts ticking when goods are received at the DEC. So, um, yeah, like I said, very, very much recommend this best practice to adjust your, your invoice timing to uh, match with when goods are going to land at the DC or the store. All right. Um, jumping into Target, um, a couple of these at Target, code AO30 at Target is their really standard shortage deduction. You invoiced for more than they say they received. Uh, we see these all the time at Target. Just like Walmart, these are very commonly not valid and can be disputed in one back with the same type of proof documentation that Carter mentioned. Uh, but another type of deduction at Target is an A176. And this will come across with a description of auto chargeback. And Target doesn't give you a whole lot of detail on these out of the box. Basically, this is anytime there's a mismatch between what was invoiced and what they received, but they couldn't quite identify where that mismatch occurred. Was it a pricing issue? Was it a substitution of items? Was it a shortage of items? They just know that they, didn't get as much in value of goods as what you invoiced for. So it kicks out this auto charge back and it's on the supplier to understand where that happened. So typically uh, this is a difference between um, uh, whether it's, you know, case pack quantities or warehouse pack quantities um, or you know, the, the volume of products shipped within a case, um, you know, that's where often these issues arise. So what we see with Target is uh, I want to say roughly half of these A176s actually end up being shortage deductions when you dig into the details. So may not say shortage deduction on the reason code, but A176s oftentimes are related to short shipping. 
we throw this slide in here just because it's big and scary and ugly, but um, this is a, a basically a diagram of Target's invoice matching system for when they receive goods. Um, what they're looking for is, you know, what did we receive? What was invoiced? Go back and check for more. And it's kind of flowing through this workflow at any given point in time. Most retailers have a process like this uh, for how they're trying to auto reconcile invoices and receipts. Um, Target just explicitly defines theirs. So what I'll say for Target is uh, you know, we really regularly see shortage deductions taken, but items arrive later and we don't see this diagram work in real time like you would expect it to. Goods are received later, the shortage was already taken, they don't reconcile it automatically, and it's on the supplier to go back and dispute it and prove your own system shows that goods were received at a later time. Here's the delivery receipt because Target often makes those available and dispute those shortages and get them paid back. Right. Amazon doesn't have a number code or anything confusing like that. Amazon just calls these shortage chargebacks essentially the same thing. Sometimes they're called purchase quantity variants. Same deal. Invoice for more than what they say they received. Amazon and on this next slide, uh, like we talked about a little bit, there's this concept of uh, their, what they call smart match. So where they are kind of, they say they're continuing to look for cases and they will apply them. We do see Amazon do this, I'd say more than other retailers, where if they do find additional cases later, they will apply them and, and reduce the amount of the deduction that was taken. But it still does not make up for the the majority of shortages that we see taken and many of which are still invalid so also a concept at amazon uh, this concept of potential shortages versus remaining shortages amazon will show you product received uh, not quite in real time but in you know a little bit more transparently than, than some other retailers so you'll have a bit of an idea of what are potential shortages versus what was actually you know still remaining once they're done looking for additional product Same deal with Amazon on how to prevent these. I'm not gonna go into too much detail here. Carter covered most of this. With Amazon, uh, your item setup is absolutely critical. Item setup and package labeling is very, very critical for Amazon because so much of their system is automated. If you have a little tiny issue there, you're going to have big issues down the line. Uh, if your items aren't set up exactly how uh, they are in your invoicing system. Lastly, we'll dive into Kroger a little bit. Code fours at Kroger are their standard code for a shortage deduction, uh, similar to a 22 at Walmart or an AO30 at Target. Um, code fours are pretty cut and dry. Uh, you know, there was more invoice than what they received. There's also a concept of a code six at Kroger, uh, which is another type of shortage item invoice not received. Uh, the little trick with code sixes is sometimes they are accompanied by code sevens, which is a, you know, an offsetting credit for an overage. Uh, and sometimes you'll get a six and a seven on the same invoice. Sometimes they completely offset each other. Uh, so you had a code six deduction for $500. You had a code seven for an overage for $500. They offset at the end of the day, that invoice got paid in full. That doesn't always happen with code sixes. Uh, we still see the net uh, dollars taken in code sixes far outweighs what's paid back in code sevens. But it is interesting to note uh, because Kroger is one of the few retailers that will willingly pay you for overages without you having to invoice them directly to get paid on overages. Those overages uh, come across as code sevens. And lastly, Kroger has a code eight, which is very similar to the A176s that we were describing for Target, where this is a automated kickback uh, for some kind of mismatch between what was received and what was invoiced, but they weren't able to nail down exactly why. They just know that you invoiced for more value than what they think they received. Usually this is due to unit-based differences, kind of like I described with Target, you know, packs versus sleeves, case pack quantities, those types of things. You have to reference the deduction details and usually take a look at the purchase order. Uh, consider the unit cost on the PO and compare that to the unit cost on the invoice. And that's a quick way to identify if there were uh, unit differences between the order and the invoice. Uh, because what was on the PO is what Kroger's receiving system is going to expect. So if that was, you know, a case pack of four, their receiving system is going to expect that one case has four. 
Um, and if that doesn't match what's on the invoice, that's going to cause you a lot of problems. So usually that's uh, the root of issues that kind of look like short shipping issues, um, but uh, get deducted as a code date. All right. We went as quick as I could. We got five minutes and I think a lot of questions. So we do have quite a few questions. So I, I'm going to, I'm going to time box you on these. You get like 30 seconds per question. You ready? All right. For Kroger, should it take over it? Should it take over a year for a response to a dispute? If they deny, is it too late to re-dispute? Any ideas? Ooh, should it take over a year? No, it should not. Does it take over a year? Sometimes it does, unfortunately. Kroger is, I would say, one of the slowest retailers that we see at responding to disputes. Walmart fluctuates. Sometimes they're pretty quick. Uh, sometimes they get super backlogged and it takes forever with Walmart. Kroger, kind of across the board, takes a long time. A year is pretty excessive um, from what I've seen, but yeah, that's unfortunate. With Kroger, that 180-day dispute window is fixed. When they deny a dispute, you have to start over. So if you're trying to start over and it's been more than 180 days, their system won't let, won't let you. And so with Kroger, yes, you can dispute as many times as you want, but it has to be within 180 days. And oftentimes it takes them longer than that to review. So with Kroger, it's really critical to get those disputes submitted as soon as they occur, as the deduction occurs, so that you get a second chance if it's denied the first time. But a year review time, I'm sorry, that's that's rough. Yeah, that, that is rough. It seems like their hands are kind of tied in that situation. Yeah. So I have a situation where Walmart has claimed that we sent the wrong product with no notification and issued a shortage deduction. When disputing, they have provided no documentation of what they actually received and they donated the product. Any suggestions on what to do in this case? Ooh. Sorry, I'm reading through that one again. We sent the wrong product with no notification. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, so I would imagine at Walmart, those often come across as a code 13, like for a substitution. Um, that, as far as fighting that, your best course of action is going to be similar to fighting, you know, any kind of shortage where you're trying to prove what was shipped compared to what was invoiced. I think that may have been asked by the same listener who uh, was talking about collect, shipper load, and count. So that might be a tough scenario. Um, but again, you know, best practices like, like carter mentioned um you know, packing lists photographic evidence doesn't hurt but um, at the end of the day your best friend is a uh, carrier signed bill of lading ideally not marked shipper load and count and fight that one uh, you know if it gets denied push back with walmart you can resubmit disputes if you stay on top of your walmart disputes they give you a chance to push back before they close out the dispute altogether so you can keep the same dispute alive, so to speak, for a longer period of time. That coupled with their two-year dispute window means you can push back multiple times on Walmart disputes. So um, oftentimes in about three, they'll cut you off and just say this is flat denied. But if you have any kind of proof documentation to help your cause, you can leverage that. Yeah, that's great. Okay, I'm going to cut us off because we have a hard deadline for our next webinar. So hopefully everyone is staying on with us. Um, thank you, you guys for joining us here today. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, thank you, Eric and Carter for all of your wonderful information. You guys are always a blast to have on. So um, thank you, everyone. We'll hopefully see you here in a couple minutes. Bye.